what what essentially Klaus Schwab right, and, <laughs> I gotta Harari, hear this. <laughs> and Harari are assuming is, and this is tragic, and they're 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 not philosophers. Yuval's a, a pretty decent historian and kind of a good raconteur and a good writer, right? Klaus, you know, has his vision of the world, right? What they're assuming is, is that there's no field of value. And that's yes, critical, that's a very good point. It's critical to understand. So in essence, they've deconstructed the field of value, not because they've done it directly. They're actually parrots of late modernity, and postmodernity merged together, which from David Hume and on have deconstructed the field of value. Yuval, you know, my dear friend Yuval in chapter two of Homo sapiens, he says there's no ultimate distinction between, let's say, Qaddafi's Libya and universal human rights. They're both just, and I'm quoting directly from chapter two, they're both just fictions, figments of our imagination and social constructs. So what, once there's no field of value, then there's no unique personhood, right? Because unique personhood, personhood's a value and uniqueness is a value. Once there's no unique personhood, once there's no choice, Yuval assumes, as he writes in another book called Homo Deus, an entire chapter, that choice does not exist. Schwab assumes that choice does not exist as a value or as a reality. So once you assume there's no field of value, once you assume that unique personhood is not a value and that personhood's not a value, then if you're faced with existential risk, what you're going to do is you're going to try and control the entire story. If they assume that there's no field of value and there's no choice, then why are they imposing their values and using the power of their choices on the rest of the world? Be, and that's a beautiful question. And that's the what you just pointed out brilliantly is what we might call the, perf- the, the technical word for it is a performative contradiction at the heart of modernity and postmodernity. Meaning on the one hand, we say there's no field of value. On the other hand, we say that our values are, are the best ones. Yes, right? I, I call it manipulation and greed myself. Now, I, I want to actually give you another perspective if I can challenge, you know, a little bit as the two men we can have this conversation. I love it. Give it, give it to me, baby. I don't, I don't think Yuval's coming from manipulation and greed. I don't think that's his. his you just think he's just so deep into his own belief system. He can't I, I see think anything else. I think it's actually even deeper than that. I think Klaus Schwab is even deeper than that. So I'm going to, I'm going to share with you something which is, is very dramatic. I'm actually about to publish a book with my colleague, Zach Stein on what we call techno feudalism. Love to and, hear about it. And, I think what's actually motivating Klaus Schwab and Harari is that which motivated their hidden teacher. You know, and whenever you have, a, you always have a Sith Lord and an apprentice, right? In Star Wars, right? They actually have a person that they're modeling themselves on, who's actually a hidden teacher that they never cite. They hide their relationship to him, but he's actually the person that actually dominates their thought. And we've actually shown in this book that everything they're doing actually directly emerges. His name is B.F. Skinner. Oh, you're kidding me. Yes. That indeed. sound, now that you say that, it's obvious. Right. Isn't it's that wild? It's freaking behavioral control. Actually, B.F. Skinner, who was the reigning Don at Harvard for six decades, who writes a book. Now, stay close. This is wild, Paul. We're now going to unearth something, maybe for the first time in, in public, and it's it's shocking so B.F. Skinner writes a book in 1948 called Walden II. And Walden II is written, you know, around the same time as Orwell's 1984, but it's much more frightening. And Walden II is about how you create a community. And in that, and he, this is about a community that he created, as it were, in fiction called Walden II. And he creates absolute control over the community with no one knowing that the control is being exercised. Right. In other words, there are invisible levers of control. Sounds now, wireless. Wireless, exactly. Now, Skinner had a notion called a Skinner's box. And in a Skinner's box, you have rats and pigeons. And you create what Skinner called schedules of reinforcement to cause the rats and the pigeons to behave in a particular way. And But Skinner is motivated not by evil. This is the very, very important to understand because... 
one of the mistakes in some of the, the echo chambers is this assumption that these guys are all just power and greed. Some of them are, right? There's a lot of power and greed stuff, but there's actually another motivation. Skinner actually believed and got very early that we were facing what we might call existential risk. And that's planetary catastrophe. Yeah. Because he didn't believe in humanity. He didn't believe <laughs> in the human heart. He didn't believe yeah. in human possibility. He believed that the only way we could avoid that disaster was to exert total control and to transform all of the world into a controlled environment, which was controlled not by politics. Politics became irrelevant, was controlled by invisible, what he called controllers, who were actually behind the scenes manipulating reality. Now, stay with me one more step. This is going to be even more shocking. There's a book called The Orange Glow right, by Brian Deere, which analyzes the rise of the web world. And you know who the first chapter is about? B.F. Skinner. Wow. Because B.F. Skinner was deeply connected to the rise of the internet because he viewed the internet world as the modality which would allow for the creation of Walden 2, the worldwide Skinner's box. And he actually writes that we don't have instruments and methods to accomplish this control on a worldwide basis. Along comes the MIT Media Lab, and they develop, they represent the development of this entire new force in the world called data science. Yeah. And data science takes the Skinner's box and basically transposes it onto the web and allows for the reduction of human beings to their lowest common denominator. We get upgraded algorithms and downgraded human beings, but they're doing it. You know, the MIT Media Lab, Skinner, Schwab, and Harari, because they actually believe that this is the only choice we have, and they believe there's no value. As Skinner says very clearly in Walden 2, is just a schedule of reinforcement, just a lever of control, then why wouldn't you try and control the world through a Skinner's box? So we just got to the heart of the matter, which is, I think, so critical. It is, but there's a paradox in it. Please. You said they were concerned of some sort of an existential crisis, right? Some of them. Skinner was. Okay, right? good. The MIT Media Lab is, and Harari is. Okay, so it means that they're doing this to try to avoid some kind of an existential crisis. But the point is, here's the paradox. They've created one. COVID yeah. itself has destroyed yeah. the psychology of children, people's health, safety, security, without going on. Paul, you, you're, you, are, Paul you are absolutely right. So if I can frame it for you in one sentence with your permission. Please. There's two forms of existential risk. One is the death of humanity, meaning yeah. we actually, we go down. Yeah. The second is what I call the death of our humanity. Yes, that's and it, essentially what you're saying, which I think is absolutely right. And Zach and I write it in techno feudalism is that in the attempt to save us from the death of humanity, they're directly causing the second form of existential risk, the death of our humanity. In shamanic terms, Please. they are inducing soul loss on a global scale. They are inducing the downgrading of our essential humanity and the corroding of the essential eros of the human being and the reduction of the human being to a nanobot on a web. And the only response to that has to be, right, revolution. Yes. But revolution, I mean, like revolution, but revolution has to mean that we actually articulate a new world philosophy. Yes, and I, I think we are, and we're going to get into this. I that's think. what we're doing here together. 